Aperture. Good evening. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Aperture and Parsons for um, inviting me along. Uh, if at any point I wander off the microphone, which I tend to do, just like wave at me or something, and we'll, I'll try and get back on. Um, I was sort of focusing this talk around uh, the stuff that's in Aperture this uh, month, uh, this season, uh, which is the Drone Scan project, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but in large part about just kind of how I think about image making now, uh, as someone who's not, certainly not a photographer, it doesn't really come from a background of image making in any particular way, uh, but I sort of ended up doing it for various reasons, uh, or in various ways. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I want to start by talking about this image, um, which has fascinated me, for, um, fascinated me for a long time, and then I discovered what it was, and it fascinated me even more. Um, this is, a, as you can see, a, a photograph, or at least an image of a drone. Um, it's a, an image that, as I was researching drones, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, I saw kind of repeated over and over and over again all over the place. Uh, here it is on the homepage of a, a British NGO that actually uh, campaigns on issues surrounding drone warfare. Um, here it is on the website of the Pakistan's largest English language newspaper. Um, here it is, in fact, printed out and pasted on the wall in Kabul so at, a, at a, drone, a protest against drone use in Afghanistan. Um, this image has been endlessly, endlessly reproduced because um, it's the first Google image result for the word drone, um, which is basically a fairly major way of getting your image circulated around the place. So um, if you see it, it means basically that someone's been incredibly lazy in their image choice. Um, well, or, or not entirely, to be fair. Um, they may have been looking for a particular image, and, and this happens to be a fairly unique one in that there's not a lot of good, clear images of these things in flight firing weapons. Uh, and that's, that makes it quite interesting. Um, um, but, you know, still, nevertheless, because it's this first result and because it has certain unique qualities, it's been endlessly reproduced across the web. Um, you see it in thousands of times, and I've, I've seen it in print a few times as well. Um, and the thing about this image is it's not a photograph. Um, I'd, I'd been staring at it for long enough with this kind of uncanny feeling about it, um, being like convinced there was, there was something wrong. And, and when you start to see it blown up big, you start to kind of notice some of these discrepancies. There's kind of problems with the angle of the type. Um, if you look up how, um, how they assign tail numbers to aircraft, you realize that this is an impossible number it has painted on it, um, that this, this group didn't, uh, the, the insignia on the plane doesn't correspond to a unit that flies these aircraft and so on and so forth. And above all of that, it's, it's just sort of too clean, it's too nice, it's too smooth. Um, uh, and that's because it's not real, it's a, it's a, 3D, it's a 3D rendering. Um, it's an entirely fabricated image um, created in 1999 by a, a visualizer, a, a kind of hobbyist 3D designer called Mike Hahn who created it in a, in a 3D modeling program just to you know, test his own skills essentially. Um, uh, and, yeah, very accurate, very good model. He posted it to a, a couple of forums where it just ended up sort of entering the image stream of the internet and, and thus being kind of endlessly reproduced. The picture, he, I've never found the background. I, I spoke to him, I kind of chased this down eventually and various people chased this image down. And um, it, apparently those are real Afghan mountains behind that he found on Flickr or somewhere. But apart from that, it's, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all constructed. Um, uh, here it is in the original posting on the 3D design forum. Um, and, uh, but what, what strikes me sort of incredibly strongly about this is, is this image of kind of the 21st century's most kind of, in many senses, kind of elusive and invisible technology is itself a, an entire fabrication and has sort of entered back into its own representation. Um, someone sent me this this morning. Uh, this is it actually being used by the U.S. Air Force in their own um, planning documents for the next kind of 15 years of, of UAV strategy. Um, so it's, it's kind of become totally, um, totally kind of recycled and it's just you know, become uh, more real than the objects themselves in, in, in kind of the popular imagination. This is the image of, of how we kind of see these things. Um, and, and so, you know, why this image? Why has this image become so sort of widely circulated? Why is it endlessly reproduced? And for me, a huge part of that is because, you know, we require images to understand the world around us. 
Um, no more so now than when that world is so kind of intensely technologically augmented that it's underlying with the kind of um, technological processes, most of which are largely invisible to us. And one of the reasons that I've focused work for the last couple of years a lot on drones as machines and the, and the wars that they've produced and the wars that they kind of shape and demand is because for me the drones kind of um, embody something of those technologies. Um, they are ultimately physical objects, but ones that we hardly ever see. And their primary quality is that they're networked, that they're connected, that they allow this kind of sight and action at a distance in much the way that all of our kind of network communication technologies do. Um, and the question is, how do you make pictures of a world like that? How do you... Um, how do you show the world as it really is when the contemporary world, what drives it, is, is kind of largely and almost always invisible to us? Um, this, all of this work started with me trying to understand these objects. This is a little plastic model of one, a kind of, um, uh, you know, from a, a hobby shop, uh, which I, I made just as another way of trying to, trying to see and understand one of these things, thinking that I would never get to kind of stand in front of one of them. I'd never be able to see and touch one myself. Um, so this kind of insane sort of close encounters of the third kind type approach of endlessly modeling these things to understand them. But this, was, this certainly was not enough. It's too small. It's too dinky. So I sat there with a friend playing with them, and we realized that even just the scale of these things kind of eluded us. And, and so our first attempt at drawing one was to literally go out into the car park of my student the studio in London and sketch this thing out on the ground just, just for scale, like that would be a start. And as soon as we did that, it suddenly had this entirely different presence to us. Um, it suddenly became kind of real to us in a way that it, that it really wasn't before. And I've since done these kind of, uh, the, this installation in various places around the world and I've released the plans for it. If you can go to my website, you can download the plans if you want to draw one. Um, and people have. Um, and it's the same thing as the Photoshop drone. It's people kind of crave an illustrations of these things that they understand, it seems. Um, uh, one of the, the first thing that everyone see, says when they see one of these things is like, oh, I had no idea it was so big. Which is like the most kind of ridiculous, basic, banal thing you could say about it, except it's incredibly key. Like, how, how do you not know that this thing, which is increasingly now, though it didn't used to be in the news, that is a subject of conversation commented upon on the media all the time as part of kind of lawmaking and policy decisions and not even know like its physical dimensions. That, that seems deeply, has always seemed deeply strange to me. Um, and, but going out and drawing these things in the streets, making them visible in this way, has a whole bunch of effects for how you have a conversation about those things. This one was in Washington, D.C. last summer. Um, we drew it um, in fact, right next to the entrance of the... This is the public entrance to the White House just here, which is kind of brilliant. Um, it's part of an exhibition of drone-related stuff at the, at the Corcoran, um, which is this round building here. Um, and again, it, was, it kind of brings this thing back into a conversation, but the conversation, I would have to say, still happens largely remotely. One of the beautiful things about these is they, they work almost better as images as they do as, as real installations. Um, they... they, they we, a lot of my work, it seems to be every time I produce something physical, it's only in order to kind of photograph it digitally and put it back online and return it to that circulation of images again so it can reach, a, reach an audience that is, you know, receptive to these things. But it has other effects as well. Um, I went to uh, Brisbane in Australia late last year, um, which is a very, very long way from the UK, um, in order to draw one of these. And I was going to draw a, a global hawk, a really big one at this place, the... Um, uh, National Li uh, State Library of Queensland, um, and it was, I was prevented from doing so by the um, state government, who turned out to be um, particularly boring, right-wing, um, bureaucratic idiot people. Um, uh, and they were bothered about, they were just scared, essentially. They were scared of, a, of, a, of an outline of a plane. This is the interesting thing. And, and, and you know, I, I, I'd chosen this particular drone for various reasons associated with Australia, but of course, as soon as he was get sort of pushed back to it, you start to dig even deeper. Um, and actually what you, you discover in, in talking about drones in Australia in particular is that they have a different resonance there. This, this technology brings certain kind of the politics of its origin 
and kind of dumps it in other places, parts of the world where these things are used, but it, it has different effects wherever they are. In Australia, the primary kind of domestic use for drones is in controlling immigration. Uh, they have an absolutely horrific immigration policy that involves um, essentially patrolling international waters to prevent any, uh, anyone coming to seek asylum on a boat from entering Australian waters. They're turned back and kind of dumped in quite horrific camps uh, in Papua New Guinea and, and Narao and these various other um, Indian Ocean islands. Um, and that's what they want drones for there. And in, in, but by kind of going there and sketching these things out, you, you start to illuminate these things. And you realize that these, this is not a, just a drawing of a plane. It's a kind of uh, a diagram of a political system. The political systems that are produced by these technologies and that are kind of carried with them as they spread around the world. These, the technologies kind of emerge for one use in a particular area. They then kind of transfer that intent and motive with them as they go other places, and it, it can take new forms, but they always kind of reproduce it to some extent as well. In, in looking at the kind of drone stuff, you know, I was particularly interested not just, again, in the form of these things, but this thing of what it is that they do when they arrive and how you, how you can come to understand that as well. Um, because a lot of the things that drones particularly do uh, has been largely hidden. So you have the kind of overt wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, the declared wars, and you have the undeclared wars, the secret wars, the things that happen in Pakistan, in the Yemen, in Somalia, and a number of other places. Um, and um, these are not spoken about. They are not, there's no press releases about these actions. There's no, uh, you know, nothing is claimed about them. Uh, there are, however... People like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the UK or the Long Wall Journal in the US who collate eyewitness reports, um, who look through local media sources and try and piece together what is, what is happening in these places, which kind of go without any kind of official oversight and largely without any journalistic presence either, at least not Western journalists. Um, and they produce these amazing reports uh, with as much information as they can, which is still often very little about about when these things have occurred and strikes and deaths and so on and so forth. Um, but again, you know, there was a core problem for me here, which was this kind of absence of imagery, this complete, there's this data, but it's very hard to, to create in the mind a kind of imagination of what's occurring here. And this seems particularly strange to me in the present day, in the 21st century, because we've had over 100 years of mass media um, which has been dedicated to bringing us imagery of that stuff. In fact, that's been like the our harshest criticism of, of much of this media when we had to critique it is, is that it's, it's so focused on the image and not on the information, yet here we have total information, no image. And, and, it, and, it, and without that image, it, 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 it apparently you know, lacks and fails to gain the kind of traction and impact that, that it might otherwise do. Um, you know, we've, we've been sending cameramen to battlefields for, for a long time. Before that, we sent illustrators to battlefields. In the Napoleonic Wars, there'd be someone painting it. And yet now we, 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 we exist in this kind of vacuum of imagery of these places. And this is doubly strange when you think that we've spent the last kind of um, you know, decade as well building uh, a system for seeing the whole world uh, in, in publicly available digital maps, in uh, these kind of satellite imaging systems. You know, I can't find out what's going on in, in the Yemen or Pakistan, but I can take out this little black box in my pocket and I can see through satellites. I can zoom into any kind of point on the Earth's surface in order to be able to observe it in some way. But there's still a distance here. There's still a, you know, an incredible number of biases and power relationships kind of embedded in this kind of overhead aerial point of view, but hell, it's, it's a start. Um, so I started following the reports of... Um, uh, of, of the Long Wall Journal and TBIJ, of, of the reports of these strikes, and locating as best I could the sites of these strikes. And again, this isn't 100% accurate by any means, but it's sort of ballpark areas. This is the village of Babalgar in, in South Waziristan, where at 2.30 a.m. on January the 6th, 2013, up to five drones killed between eight and 18 people. Um, you haven't seen any pictures of this place in, in the news, apparently, but yet it's recorded by a you know, a digital globe satellite at, at, at some point uh, within the last couple of years, and this imagery kind of is available for you to explore. This is Masaki in North Waziristan in the tribal areas of Pakistan, July 13th, 2013, two men killed riding a motorcycle. This is a, like it's a town. This isn't like remote desert. This isn't like, you know, some kind of high distant training camp. This is a town of a few thousand people, um, which we don't see pictures of. 
Miran Shah is an even bigger city. It was July 3rd, 2013. There's been so many strikes in Miran Shah, it's ridiculous. If you know anything about the history of tribal areas of Pakistan, that, you know that hi, the British were, um, <laughs> were flying what we called police missions there um, 100 years ago. Uh, we sent some of the first uh, British fighting military aircraft to exactly this town uh, in 1916. Um, to fly the same kind of flights we're now flying over it with drones. Um, this is one of the most recent ones. As this geography extends, this is, this is, um, uh, this is Somalia, um, the village of, uh, of Lower Shabelle, uh, which is about 200 kilometers south of, of the capital, or maybe former capital, Mogadishu. Um, Drones kind of extend the reach of this warfare. It's the first time in two years there's been a definite strike outside the, the other places. And in order to make visible these landscapes, to take these, these images of these, these landscapes, try and share them a bit, I, which is what I do. I post them to social media, put them on Instagram, on Tumblr, on Twitter. Um, as a way of, in the way that hopefully these images link up, this kind of... Um, the possibility of seeing these places through satellite imagery. I want to link up this kind of, um, this way in which we view the world now, which is as much largely through the kind of glimpses of it that we get over our friends' shoulders in, in kind of pictures on social media as it is much through the, through the media, the kind of what we would consider to be the kind of main, mainstream media, authoritative media, news media. Um, these connecting the various ways in which the network is used, just as the... Um, you know, the military use of drones is, is, is this very, you know, direct network-like thing, but that runs with a tendency towards secrecy and obscurity and violence. You know, this is, this is another network that runs on exactly the same infrastructure that's tuned towards openness, that's tuned towards social media, that's supposed to bring us all together. These things run on the same infrastructure and on the same kind of image-making. You know, these are the same views of the landscape that the drone pilots see from far away. Um, and, you know, it's your daily dose of little bits of one possible kind of reality. That's what these things are meant to do. They show you the, the truth of the world, and this is a, a slightly darker one. Um, it also, kind of for me, a secondary and minor but important effect, kind of exposes some of the biases of these networks as well. Uh, the, just as with the drone shadows, the first comment is always, I had no idea how big it was. Um, the, um, the first comment with drone Instagram is always, I don't want to like this, but... You know, this, this thing that like, liking the image is the only thing structurally built into the system that you're allowed to do, and it's not an appropriate response to these images. There's always, well, as, as some of the viewers would come out. You get the most amazing, I do not participate in the comments of this program, of this project, um, because they, they're particularly virulent, the kind of responses as, as you would expect in kind of social media. But, but the, um, the images shape an understanding of the media in which they occur as well, which I think is kind of incredibly important. Um, out, of, um, out of the work on drone Instagram came a kind of another series of images as well called, uh, with brilliant originality, Watching the Watchers, um, uh, which kind of inverts this, this relationship between these, these photograph-making machines, the drones, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and the other sources of photography that we now have. Um, I discovered this one kind of pretty much by chance. Um, having already started to make the drone shadows, I found an, an actual drone shadow, um, this is a photograph taken by a satellite of a, of a predator drone taking off from Creech Air Force Base in the US. I was actually looking for the, um, the boxes, that they, the sort of shipping containers that drones are controlled from, uh, of which Creech Air Force Base um, has a huge number of both British and, uh, sorry, of US and formerly British uh, people based there controlling the drones. When I went to look for these shipping containers on Google Earth, I found an actual drone just about to take you off into flight. Which is, a, which is a kind of extraordinary, amazing image and such an incredible moment. There's a surprising wealth of imagery out there, but you don't necessarily get a huge number of images at the same spot. Google Earth allows you to track back through a few historical images, depending on location. And you can look on kind of Bing maps and other, you know, Nokia and other satellite maps. But to catch one in flight like this seemed to be, to me, this kind of almost miraculous event. But, you know, there must be many more like this. So I started looking through uh, records of um, 
you know, who flies the drones, which military regiments do, and looking, going back and tracking where they'd been um, um, deployed to. So here's Beale Air Force Base in California, three of the Global Hawk aircraft I mentioned before, um, and, and the manufacturers of these things as well. This is General Atomics testing airstrip at Grey Butte Field, also in California. General Atomics build the, the Predators and the Reapers. Um, or um, Libby Airfield in Arizona. Um, the, these ones are interesting to me particularly because they bring us back to the other use of drones I mentioned in Australia. These ones, are, I believe, belong to the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security, uh, which uses them to patrol the, the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, but the geography of the drone, kind of, as I said before, kind of extends well beyond. Uh, this is Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, uh, this is Joint Base Balad in Iraq in 2004. Um, this is Camp Chibale in Djibouti uh, in October of last year. This is probably where that last one to Somalia flew from. Um, uh, this is where, and, and also probably the ones to Yemen as well. Those are probably flying out of, uh, most of them flying for Djibouti, some also possibly flying out of, out of Saudi Arabia. To find these images does involve a kind of stupid amount of detective legwork, uh, looking through um, kind of records of deployment, looking through, you know, the, 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 the different regiments that fly these things, looking through kind of rumor and, and hearsay on kind of aviation forums, and, and then looking through reams of this information, because this information exists kind of within the layers of huge numbers of databases that have to be kind of peeled back and explored, just as kind of almost as much as there would be if you had to go and walk the kind of borders of these airfields themselves. But it should be stressed, it's all publicly available imagery. There was a particularly paranoid article about this work in, in the Washington Post last week, which basically ran that it was like kind of a British man spying on U.S. Air Force bases. It was kind of like just using Google Maps, mate. Like this is just like, and, and not, not only do I think that is just you know irresponsible journalism, essentially from a from a journalistic organisation to categorise that kind of work as spying, I think that's slightly bizarre. Um, it's also kind of hugely damaging because like this is. This is civics. This is the, the stuff that forms our world. It's the stuff we pay for, the stuff that our politicians do, and we have a kind of right to go and, go and look at how it's, how it's operating. Um, this is in Cielik Bay, uh, in Kielik Air Base in Turkey, uh, where the U.S. flies drone missions at the invitation of, of the Turkish government to monitor the Kurdish PKK rebels. Uh, it's probably also being used for reconnaissance of Syria as well. Um, but, you know, you get the... Increasingly, as I exhaust the possible sources for this, I found a few like this. This is a photograph, another photograph of a drone in flight in Yemen, which is just such an extraordinary occurrence for me. Um, this kind of extraordinary, unintentional photography, you know, that this has been unearthed. Um, and there's sort of great use of, of uh, yeah, this kind of idea of unintentional, uh, unintentional photography, I think, with um, artists like John Raffman and his Nine Eyes project or, um, or Mishka Henna's Landscapes. Um, but I'm, you know, as much as I find a kind of aesthetic beauty in this, in, in, in images like this as well, I'm sort of less interested in the images they're captured, as this kind of strange situation we find ourselves with regard to that the sort of agency and intention of the image itself and the, the processes by which it's captured and, and transmitted. So, you know, included in this series is, is this image, which has a kind of slightly different weight to the other ones for me. Um, this image became public and appeared in a lot of media in 2009 um, at a time when the American Pakistani governments were denying that drone operations were taking place or had ever taken place in, in Pakistan um, or that American forces were based in Pakistan. Um, but this image clearly shows um, three U.S. unmanned aerial vehicles at Shamsi Air Base in Pakistan. 2009, this came out in the newspaper. The U.S. and Pakistani governments were forced to admit that this was occurring. But here's the thing. This image was actually taken in 2004. Um, and it's still there in Google Earth. And you can still go and look for it. And I have no idea how long it was there, how long it was sort of sat in that database unseen by human eyes before it was kind of brought forth and illuminated and made sense of in this way. There's the vastness of this imagery that we're collecting that still requires you know, human eyes on it to kind of to seek it out and to make sense of it. And it's a strange kind of way of working, collaborating not really with the camera, but with the, the image itself and with these databases, these kind of vast systems of imagery in order, to, in order to assign meaning to them. 
I've got a Tumblr called Landsat, uh, which is about as basic as a blog can be. Um, and what it does is a very simple thing, which is that it automatically blogs every single image released by the Landsat program. Um, those who don't know, um, the Landsat program is um, the longest running program photographing the Earth from space. Um, it's acquired millions and millions and uncountable numbers of, of images of, of the Earth since, uh, since the first Landsat went up in 1969. Um, the current satellite is Landsat 8, which is where these images are taken from, uh, which has been up there since February of 2013. Um, Landsat 8, it circuits the Earth in this sun-synchronous orbit, so it's always seeing the Earth in sunlight. It captures 400 images every single day, and these images are, are massive. They're not... Um, you can't pick out humans in them. You can sort of just pick out roads, but they... You know, so it's, it's geographical scale image rather than kind of human scale image, kind of city scale rather than, rather than car scale. Um, but there are vast amount of images encoded... A vast amount of information encoded in these images. 400 images every day, which a complete photograph of the Earth every, every 16 days. Um, and every single one of these images, crucially, is in the public domain. Uh, it's, a, it's a NASA and um, the NOAA, I think it is, run program, and on all of these images, or at least it's well, to provide this kind of constant, open, public, and ever-changing portrait of the Earth. And again, I, I love these images for their kind of aesthetic value. I, I love this rotation of them. Uh, which is because, obviously, the, the, Earth, the satellite is not going north to south, so they, they rotate the images on publication, so up is, up is north in this sense. Um, but, but also, you know, what, what's in them, and there's, there's so much to say about satellite imagery, and I could talk about it in various ways in, huge number of, um, in a huge number of kind of themes of it, really. Um, but the core thing that I've been getting out of satellite imagery recently is this understanding of the way that the, the machines kind of see, see the world. Um, uh, and, and crucially, how they see it differently to how the human eye sees. Because um, Landsat 8, in this case, and the previous ones as well, it's not a camera. Right? It's not taking a photograph. Uh, what it has on it is a multispectral sensor, uh, which is basically a, a, a combination of, in, in Landsat 8's case, 11 different sensors, which capture data, essentially, across a range of different spectra, from the ultraviolet through the visible spectrum and into the near and, and thermal infrared. And you can combine those different frequencies of, of image um, in, in, in various ways. You can use it to kind of see dust and smoke and atmospheric pollution. You can tell the difference because of the different reflectivity and the different spectrum of chlorophyll between healthy and unhealthy plants. Um, there's even a tiny, tiny infrared frequency that allows you to see just the clouds and to block out all the kind of uh, earth underneath it, which allows you later to remove that cloud cover and, and to, to see through it. I just love that. And uh, there's, a, there's a little robot up there that's just taking pictures of all the clouds. And those, those spectral sensors are why you also get images like this, which I've been collecting for some time. It's kind of the rainbow plane has become a bit of a kind of personal, personal en uh, emblem for me. Um, and, and it took me ages to, to figure out why. I didn't even realize I was figuring it out. Uh, but to the sudden realization of how this image is formed, which is, of course, because of those different spectral bands. Um, that as well as the infrared and the ultraviolet, there's a red, green, and blue sensors on the satellites which fire at tiny, tiny different times. But um, when they try to capture a fast-moving object like a plane, um, you get these, um, these images. This, it's, it's, it's a blur, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image that's moving less fast than the... Um, an image moving faster than the kind of shutter of this thing is capable of grasping, but it's a blur across different image spectra, right? Um, uh, which, and, and what it does is it reveals the inner workings of the machine. It's, it's an aesthetic, but which also produces an understanding of the processes which produce it, uh, which is just another form of kind of revealing the invisible technologies at work shaping these, these things. Um, this summer I'm going to draw a rainbow plane on the ground in, at Farnborough at the home of British Aviation in the manner of the drone shadows, an outline of the RGB thing. And then I'm going to photograph it from the sky again, and we're going to just keep on making this loop kind of grow ever, ever further. So, you know, but the thing about so many of these, the fascinating thing about so many of these machine-generated images, I think, is that they're kind of like the before images with no after yet, 
right? They're, they're, they're kind of waiting for, for the after to happen, for something to kind of call them to our attention. They require us to kind of come along and give them a value, to, to kind of impose meaning on them or have that meaning kind of conferred on them by events. Uh, E.L. Weitzman writes about satellite imagery in this way, kind of very convincingly. He's a, a forensic, um, forensic architecture investigator, essentially. He uses satellite images to reconstruct human rights violations and, and, and drone strikes and a number of other things. And for him, every one of these images becomes this kind of before image and for which he must kind of seek out the after image and, and kind of wind back time in, in order to understand what's occurred. You know, and, 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 and if even without machine imagery, that doesn't bring in the wealth of imagery being kind of collected accidentally, you know, in the corners of, of cell phone videos or CCTV cameras or dash cam footage of kind of meteorites suddenly appearing out of the sky. But the other thing about this machine-generated images is that we're not the only ones assigning meaning and value to it either. Um, there's a whole world of seeing and image-making, of, of sense and sensing and, and sense-making going on which takes place entirely without any human intervention at all. Um, this example here is, is um, number plate recognition. Uh, there's, there's surveillance systems that are taking photographs in order to kind of read data back out of them and store those images for future reference in, again, before images of potential crimes in kind of vast databases of surveillance databases of our movement, but capable of extracting useful images useful information from them, in this case, reading the, the number plates of, of cars. Um, these are kind of computational cameras. Um, they're eyes which don't just see the world, but actively read it and make sense of it as we do. And in turn, this kind of transforms the physicality of the world back again, because it transforms the nature of objects uh, into, into recognizable things that have different forms of meaning. They become identifiable markers and kind of objects of surveillance themselves. You know, examples of this take the, the data which is collected and acted upon by Google's prototype self-driving cars. This is one possible image because, again, all these things are just renderings for our own eyes of, um, of the way in which a Google's self-driving cars sees the world. Um, it's a kind of form of image making derived directly from uh, the approaches which were developed to power, in turn, Google's Street View which turns out to be largely a kind of information gathering exercise for machine vision like this. Um, but it's an attempt, you know, Street View was always an attempt like the Landsat program to create this kind of one-to-one -one portrait of the, of the world's, of the entire Earth's surface. And like, and like all these machines, the, the self-driving cars view their own location not just, or in fact almost sometimes not at all in, in the visible spectrum, but in radar and UV and infrared and, and with LIDAR, with kind of these, these scanning light lasers um, that, that paint the world around them with light in order to kind of capture it. There's a fascinating interview um, a while back with um, a guy, a Google engineer working on self-driving cars. And this guy was taking him through all the cameras on the car and asking him... Um, if the, if the car read the street signs. And um, he said that he didn't. Uh, they, they don't at all. This, this, this image is for, is for looking for pedestrians and other vehicles and kind of obstacles. The rules by which it traverses the street are already recorded onto a map inside it. Um, the, you know, for, for things like speed limits and one-way streets and this kind of stuff, um, the cars rely on an internal map, just like the kind of GPS that you, you know, people have in their cars. Um, which effectively kind of decides the way that you move through space. It, it, it decides your experience of the world, and the map very literally becomes the territory. Um, or take the, the systems of visualization uh, which shape the, the built environment. Um, I'm, I've, always, I've been fascinated for a long time with those, um, the images you see on kind of billboards and hoardings depicting this kind of weird imaginary future architecture uh, which is a kind of pre-photography of the, of the architecture that will eventually kind of arise from these construction sites and, but never quite ever measures up to the reality that we're eventually forced to inhabit. Um, and and that, that, this image-making process you know, is, is actually, it turns out, kind of crucial to architecture. It's increasingly relied on by architects and planners to make the necessary pitches and kind of gain the necessary permissions required for doing the building and 
in the, in, in the final you know, part. And, and that inevitably shapes the world incredibly strongly. Um, speaking, I've spoken a lot to people who make these kind of images. And um, one of these guys claimed, and I mean, but he claimed he could look at you know, huge tracts of contemporary architecture and tell you what software program had been used to, used to design it, essentially. And, and not only that, but you know, in, in, with certain kind of really low-grade crap, like the, the version of the software. Because the built environment is, is produced by the softwares that are used to design it. It's, it's built according to the, the parameters and the tolerances of, of the software and the size of the windows and the door fittings and the street furniture kind of sourced from stock libraries and, and drop-down menus. Um, and where we assign agency within this is, is particularly complex. And the same tools that are used to design the buildings are used to produce these images of it, and those images are then relied on to make the buildings. What happens, another guy told me, is, and this happens more frequently than, than he was comfortable with, is that the, you know, the guy employed to make the visualization of this architecture receives a kind of bare plan, kind of master plan from an architect. They then produce these kind of extraordinary rich images of the place and they fill it with you know, 3D pieces of furniture and fittings and floorings and wall coverings. And this is shown to the developer or the client and they go like, yes, I want that. But they want that. They want like this, this pile of kind of randomly generated stuff. Uh, that they've seen in a, in a virtual simulation of the world. And as a result, we end up living in, in what he called, I thought rather brilliantly, a kind of lorem ipsum architecture, the result of a kind of careless image-making by us and by these, these machines, these softwares and these image-making processes. The, like the rainbow planes, like the, the drone Instagram images, all of this, I think like learning to understand how seeing machines, more so than you know, anything we would previously have termed a camera, not only read but kind of shape the world is crucial to understanding how all of the technologies around us, not just the visual ones, invisibly model the world in which we live at all times and continue to produce it. What, what I'm always interested in is, is not the technology but how people understand the technology and how that understanding shapes their experience of an ability to kind of critique and act in the world. Not the images, but, but how we understand the, how those images are made and how that understanding constructs the world we live in. Because we live in this, we live this incredible paradox um, that so much of the world now is kind of shaped by very direct intentions embedded into these technologies, um, which, which have the potential to kind of render it, render those intentions and, and the possibilities and the, you know, our actions ever more kind of visible and real to us. And at the same time, those things are ever harder to perceive because those intentions are put into these softwares, into these technologies, which we don't, we, which we don't see around us, which we constantly kind of design out of view and, and relegate to the unseen. Whether that's kind of, you know, drones or, or infrastructure or or these images that are only shared between the machines ourselves as kind of raw data. Um, the images that we, that we, for me, I think that we need to be making now, they, don't, they need to not just reflect the kind of true reality of the world that we live in, which is kind of hard enough as well, but they need to be kind of mindful of, of shaping it back as well. Um, LD, thank you very much.